ಓಂ ಅಂತರಾಯ ತಿಮಿರೋಪಶಾಂತೆ ಶಾಂತಪಾವನಮಚಿತ್ಯ ವೈಭವ ತಂ ನರಂ ಪಪುಷಿಕುಂಜರ ಮುಖೆ ಮನ್ಮಹೇ ಕಿಮಿ ತುಂದಿಲಂಬ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಟು ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ ಮೈ ನೇಮ್ ಇಸ್ ವಿವೇಕ್ ರಾಳಪಂಡಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಎ ಹೈ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಸೀನಿಯರ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಮೆಡಿಸನ್ ನ್ಯೂ ಜರ್ಸಿ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಯುನೈಟೆಡ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟುಡೇ ಐಮ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಯು ಸೀ ಹಿಯರ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ದಿ ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಚರ್ ಆಫ್ ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕ್ ಮ್ಯಾರೇಜ್ ಹೌ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಡಿಲಿಬರೇಟ್ ಡಿಸೈನ್ ಹೆಸ್ ಅಪ್ ಹೆಲ್ಡ್ ಆರ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಮಲೇನಿಯ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಟ್ ದಿ ಔಟ್ ಸೆಟ್ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಆಫರ್ ಮೈ ಸಾಲಿಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಫಾರ್ ವಾಚಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ uh thank the two organizations that were instrumental to my writing of this research paper as well as this presentation before all of you and those are of course waves the world association for vedic studies and also hindu students council hsc and um so as i mentioned again this topic was the subject of a research paper that i wrote and this is going to be an abridged presentation of that research paper covering some of the important aspects um of the paper but if the topic does pique your interest and if you're intrigued you want to read further i would invite you and i would um encourage you to read the research paper it, itself for more you know documentation and sourcing and more depth into what i'm going to be talking about here so with that we can get started um the way that i organized this presentation is actually this way that i organized my research paper into six distinct sort of headings and that's kind of how i'm going to deal with what we have here um and discuss these things so the first point that i kind of have is an introduction and that is talking about the importance of marriage okay so you can see here marriage is universally important is the first point that i make and basically what that means is that regardless of what sort of civilization or what culture um in human kind you're looking at um this institution of marriage is is critically important and why exactly is that the case well looking at it from a dharmic perspective you have these 16 samskaras right 16 samskaras which i think you can kind of compare them to milestones that you're um sort of sort of passing in the various stages of life you have all the way from jata karma which is being performed um at at the time of birth all the way to the antyeshti samskara which is being performed at the time of death uh funeral rites and so you have all the way all the you know nine yards is um as you might call it spanning spanning your life these 16 samskaras and they're religious they're spiritual rites within our um dharma and marriage is preeminent among these 16 samskaras it's accepted that marriage is the preeminent one among these 16 samskaras so in our dharmic literature in our dharmic consciousness it's recognized that marriage is the most important um of these of these samskaras of these events now if we look at it from a secular st- standpoint we can understand that most of an individual's life is spent married even in the united states So we're going to ha- kind of have this dichotomy between dharmic and secular marriage at various points in this exploration and I think it kind of we we have on the one hand comparisons of of universal sort of themes that you have common among the two but then you also have distinctive elements that dis- um that make dharmic dharmic marriage distinctive from from sort of this this secular secular westernized concept of marriage but even in terms of this sort of western conception of marriage in the united states the average range of marriageable marriage uh, average range of age of marriage is 25 to 30 years and the average lifespan is 78.7 years so if you do the math you can see that majority of your life and the overwhelming majority of your adult life is is spent married even from a western conception so obviously you're you're spending a lot of time um married you're spending a lot of time with with this particular individual and that can have obviously serious effects for better or for worse on your life and its its trajectory so we've established i think that marriage is from a religious perspective and from a secular perspective from a dharmic perspective and from a western perspective crucially important now where does that lead us so we've under, we've kind of established why marriage is important now the question is why why do you 
even want to get married to begin with. And here we can see a distinction, as I was talking about, with, between secular and dharmic forms. So here we have universal factors, right? We have universal factors um, that are intrinsic within any society, any culture um, that wants to, that has this institution of marriage, which is basically any society. And the first reason is the reason why, and that's biological reproduction. If you want to sustain um, a race or um, a culture or society or whatever the case may be, you need to have reproduction, right? Reproduction ensures that that society, that culture lives on. Um, reproduction is what has sustained our human race itself for so many millions of years. Why we're still on this earth? The answer to that is, is reproduction. It's an inherently biological act. There doesn't have to be any spiritual um, spiritual sort of, um, there, there doesn't have to be any spiritual motivation to that. It's a, it's a biological act. It's an evolutionary biological act in order for, for any sort of race to, um, to live on or any sort of um, species to, to live on. The second factor is a little bit more nuanced. And the first I forgot to mention, this is something that's common with any species, again, as I said, so that includes animals, right? Any sort of animal or insect or any, any living creature, really, this, this biological reproduction aspect exists as a, well, it might not necessarily be referred to as marriage in that case, but, but some sort of mating or um, some sort of procreation, uh, male and female, Coming, coming together in order to do that. The second point is more nuanced, right? And I think this is where there's a distinction between animals and, and humans, the, the human race. And that's this more nuanced idea of happiness that you're deriving from marriage. Obviously the fact that you're going to derive support from your spouse, um, that they're here there to support you uh, through thick and thin and, you know, the, the classic marriage vows, right? Even in the West, it's, you know, through by, um, in sickness and in health, et cetera, et cetera, you know, in times of need, they're always gonna stand by you, your spouse. Um, you get this sort of happiness, obviously in the West, you know, when love is the driver of, of this sort of marriage, it's, that's obviously what the, the sort of goal is that you're finding happiness in the individual that you love. So even in the Western sort of conception, you have this idea of happiness. And even in the dharmic conception, obviously, yes, there's going to be an element of happiness. We'll talk about that uh, when we get a little bit further, but this element of happiness is something that is universally um, sought and in marriage and is a, is a driving factor beyond marriage, uh, behind marriage, excuse me. Now with dharmic marriage, the sort of distinction you see here is that there is a spiritual foundation. There is a spiritual foundation to this act of marriage. How does that work? So I'm going to, here is a Sanskritam shloka, Sanskritam verse from the Hitopadesha. And I'm going to recite it and then also sort of discuss how it plays into this idea of the spiritual foundation. Well, that's going to lead into our next section. The verse goes, Ahara nidra bhaya maithunancha samanya meta pashubhir naranam dharmo hitesham adhiko vishesho dharmena hinaha pashubhis samanaha. So basically, what the verse is saying is Ahara nidra bhaya maithunam. So it's listing out these four factors and saying they're the same between humans and animals. And so what are those four things? Ahara, food, nidra, sleep, bhaya, fear, and maitanam, uh, progeny, right? Carnal, um, carnal um, interaction and, and reproduction. These are the four common things between humans and animals. Dharmo hitesham adhiko vishesho. What distinguishes humans from animals is the pursuit of, of dharma, right? And dharma is a very, very complex term. Um, you could do a paper on just dharma alone. You can define it as duty, as righteousness, and um, so many other things. And dharma is one of the four purushasthas, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but dharma is what distinguishes humans from animals. And dharmena hinaha pashubhis samanaha. So without this pursuit of dharma, a human is equal to an animal, the writer of the verse is saying. There's, that's what's distinguishing a human from an animal because all of these other things, food, sleep, um, reproduction, and, and fear are common between humans and animals. And so this kind of goes back to this point that marriage is what, what distinguishes dharmic marriage from, 
from this sort of secular sort of marriage. And that is the pursuit of dharma, as the name itself says. And I think this verse sort of accurately reflects, kind of epitomizes why that there's that there's something bigger, that there's something broader, that there's something more meaningful um, inherent within dharmic marriage. And we're going to explore that now in the third section, which is a spiritual path. Dharmic marriage is an element of a spiritual journey. So we're going to look at this in the context of the four ashramas. So Hinduism, right, Sanatana Dharma has divides life into four different ashramas, four different stages of life. Brahmacharya, which is the student stage where the primary emphasis is on learning and study. Grihastha is the householder stage um, where this is where this is primarily where you're experiencing marriage life. You're in this um, married life. You're in this um, element of samsara. Um, you know, you're earning, you're doing various uh, types of things. You're, reprodu you're reproducing, raising children at this point in time. And this is basically where you're, you're living life to the fullest, basically in a dharmic way, of course, like we'll talk about in a second. The third stage is the stage of vanaprastha. And that is sort of, um, you're kind of withdrawing away from, uh, from this worldly life, your contemplation, um, divine contemplation, spiritual practice, etc., is accelerating to a, a greater degree. And there's there's this beginning of this this process of withdrawal, and this kind of culminates with the sannyasa or the renunciate stage, where you completely withdraw yourself from the world, and you're you're essentially renouncing renouncing the world and all worldly attachments. So where is dharmic marriage? How is that playing into this sort of um, dynamic. So as I mentioned, dharmic marriage is occurring during the grihastha stage, right? And what that shows you is that, and the, the, what is the goal? What is the goal of uh, these ashramas, right? So you can kind of think of it as sort of a road, the four ashramas um, kind of marking different points um, on that road. And the ultimate destination is, is moksha, is liberation from from because in Sanatana Dharma, we believe in the cycle of, of karma, right? The cycle that Westerners often term as reincarnation is that basically based on your papa and the punya that you earn, that you're going to be incarnated on this earth in various, uh, various sort of bodily forms. And moksha, liberation from that is, is the ultimate goal of everything that's done. And these ashramas are structured in such a way that that occurs. So that is the ultimate goal. That is the ultimate goal of these ashramas. That is the ultimate goal of, of life, according to the ideal of Sanatana Dharma. And so dharmic marriage plays a part in that as part of the grihastha, st as part of the grihastha stage. And you can see that dharmic marriage is not the beginning, nor is it the end, because you have brahmacharya, you're being academically and spiritually primed before you're even entering into the system of dharmic marriage. And you can see that it's not the end in the sense that, you know, this, this sort of worldly, worldly life, this sort of samsara is not the end, end, end all be all because you have vanaprastha and you have sannyasa, which are divine contemplation and withdrawal from this world. So that shows, that shows you sort of the context that dharmic marriage is in as part of a spiritual path within the grihastha stage. So... Now we have a, now we're taking a look at the Purusharthas, right? The Purusharthas are the four, um, four sort of, um, I think one of the sources I quote in the paper mentions something along the lines of the four, uh, four pursuits of, of human life. I think that's Sarkar, Shantanu Sarkar mentions that in my paper that I quote him as saying that. Um, and the four Purusharthas are Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. Dharma, again, righteousness or duty. It's a rough English translation. Artha is the pursuit of wealth, Kama is the pursuit of pleasure, and Moksha is obviously the pursuit of, of liberation. So the four Purusharthas are being pursued in, in sort of every stage of, of your life in one way or another, but I think what's particularly distinctive and what surprises people in some cases is the fact that you have Artha and Kama as part of the picture, and that's something that people who consider Hinduism to be in sort of ascetic faith are sort of shocked and they're like, well, wow, you have this thing of wealth earning and then all, even pleasure and wow, 
But this is sort of what dharmic marriage is. I mean, this is really where you're able to experience this artha and kama. You're not doing this in brahmacharya when you're supposed to be studying. You're not doing this in vanaprastha and sannyasa where you're withdrawing yourself from the world and withdrawing all of your attachments. This is something that's being done in the grihasthashrama, obviously making sure that it doesn't run counter to the other purusharthas, dharma and moksha. This quote here is from the, the Mahabharata. It's um, from uh, one of one of my sources, I believe, Sarkar. Again, moksha and the path of dharma is what the Mahabharata says uh, should be the ultimate pursuit, how, what an individual should be pursuing, using dharma as a conduit um, through which to achieve this ultimate goal of moksha. And this is something that's key in this um, element of dharmic marriage. In the Manudharma Shastra, um, and I quote the English translation of this in my paper by P.V. Karni, but um, in the Manudharma Shastra, it said, dharmecha thecha kamecha nati charami. This is something that is said in uh, during the, the vetting vows, uh, during the marriage ceremonies, um, saying that the two spouses will stand together in these elements of dharma, artha, and kama, which lead up to moksha. And so this shows you this sort of spiritual foundation that's had. And again, this bigger goal of moksha that exists um, underlying everything uh, that's going on. Now I segue a little bit to a woman's place, a woman's co-equal role in dharmic marriage. And I think this kind of underscores the previous points made. I think it's also important to have a discussion about this because there has been so much unfounded criticism that's been leveled at Hinduism as being patriarchal and saying that women are somehow subjugated and, and making all kinds of claims. And the, the, the truth is, this is just not something that is contained within our shastras and our religious documents. The, the truth is that perhaps the roles of the, the, a man and a woman might be different, might be different, but they are complementary to one another and one is not higher than the other. And this is a perfect example, the example of Sri Rama and Sita that, that really bears out the story that we have here. What, what exactly is this example? The example is that when Sri Rama, after he, um, after Sita, after Sita um, goes to the forests, right? Sri Rama is still king of Ayodhya, but he is not um, accompanied by his wife. So what he has to do during these yajnas that he's performing, during these fire sacrifices that he's performing is that he has to have a golden uh, pratima, a golden replica of Sita next to him um, in order for him to perform these sacrifices because it's required by the Shastras that a husband, a grihastha, a husband be accompanied by his wife that he went while he performs these sacrifices in order for those sacrifices to come to fruition. The husband cannot function with the wife is basically the, the conclusion of this. And so in order to pursue these spiritual practices and, and obtain the merit that is inherent within these practices, both of these individuals, the husband and the wife must come together for their mutual uddharana, for their mutual uddharana in Sanskrit, the meaning for their mutual um, exaltation, for both of them to be exalted and to receive this merit, to receive this punya as a result of these spiritual practices. So to make this argument that, well, you know, women are not part of part of this, um, any of these spiritual practices that they're not given the same sort of important that importance that men are, I think this negates that that completely. And that's just not the case. And that both of both of these individuals are equally important. And they're coming together to do something amazing, which is that they're uniting their collective destinies in pursuit of this ideal of moksha in in the element in, in, the, in the institution of dharmic marriage. Imprisonment or liberation, uh, dharmic marriage is, is liberating. Uh, this is the fifth point. This is um, really talking about Western versus dharmic ideals of liberation um, and how in Western, in the Western conception, love is often seen as freeing while dharmic marriage is often seen as, as oppressive. They call it arranged marriage. Um, it's, this is the broad brush term that's used um, to encompass. Um, and this is, this is um, a dichotomy that was explored originally by Arushi Ramaka. And I actually took, um, I actually incorporated that idea. She used it in the context of um, Indian dance, dance forms. And I used that, that lens in the context of um, dharmic marriage. So basically the, I, the 
the idea in the West is that um, the the Western sort of love marriage, where love is the driver of marriage, is seen as is liberating, right? They're liberated in an arranged marriage is seen as oppressive and is constraining because you're you're being oppressed by by tradition and all the diktats that it places on you, and you're not able to make the choice. Of, of your partner on your own without any sort of interference from anyone else. So that to them is, is liberating. So, but what you can see here is that according to the American uh, Psychological Association, 40 to 50% of marriages are ending in divorce in the United States. And I say this in my paper, what this means is that these individuals, a large portion of them are trying to liberate themselves from what they perceive to be liberating. They thought this love marriage thing was gonna be liberating and now they wanna liberate themselves from that. It just shows that it it's, doesn't make any sense. And it's it's not something that that's, it's, it's just a very material sense of liberation and just not something exalted, not something beyond this material life and this material world. How is this contrasted by dharmic marriage, well, as we discussed, we have this higher element of spiritual pursuit within dharmic marriage, this pursuit of moksha, where these two individuals are coming together in shared pursuit of this ideal and how their destinies are tied together. They want ultimate liberation from this material world of samsara. This material world is not the end-all be-all for them, but rather it's a launch pad for something greater while at the same time experiencing the delights of, of material life, they're not becoming bogged down in it. And that is liberation on a different plane. That is moksha, liberation on a different plane. Experiencing material happiness is the Western idea of liberation and the dharmic idea of liberation is something greater and something much more profound. And I think you can absolutely see the contrast between those, uh, those two elements. Last but certainly not least is talking about the thesis itself is dharmic marriage being the upholder um, of our dharma for millennia, right? Dharmic marriage has quite literally, and there is this is not an exaggeration, kept our dharma, our sanatana dharma alive for millennia. The first aspect here is that procreation is the sustainer of humanity. We've talked about this element already, right? Um, our dharma and, and our dharmic principles have been passed down by generation to generation to generation by dharmic marriages that have been um, that have been consummated for, for generations and where um, where men and women have, have come together for ages to, um, to to procreate to reproduce the next generation of, of dharmics. Um, I have a Samskritam, I have a um, quote from a Samskritam song here written by Sri Janardhan Hegde and the, the quote is Yatra cha bala devi swarupa bala sarve Sri Ramaha. And it basically says in, in Bharat, um, every, every girl is considered as an embodiment of Devi and every boy is considered as an embodiment of Sri Rama. And it is this sort of philosophy that has groomed so many, so many amazing individuals who have fought for and sustained our dharma. Chhatrapati Shivaji, he was raised, um, his mother Jijabai was instrumental um, in grooming him as a protector of our dharma. Swami Vivekananda, same thing, the exposure that he received in his, his childhood and um, the, the early childhood environment he grew up in, that was instrumental to him getting to the place that he, he ascended to as a protector of our dharma. Another element to look at how this dharmic marriage, this element of dharmic marriage has been a sustainer of our dharma is looking at the duties that are delineated by our shastras of a grihastha. One of the duties is welcoming guests Another is performing yajna, the fire sacrifice. And the third is perform providing alms to brahmacharis and sannyasins. And these are all upholding key aspects, key elements of our dharma, welcoming guests, right? We have the spiritual um, dictum, atiti devo bhava, atiti devo bhava. And basically viewing the guest as God and welcome, welcoming guests is upholding that, performing performing yajnas, these are performed not only for one's individual merit, for, but also for the, for loka kalyana, the welfare of the world. And that goes to our spiritual um, dictum of sarve bhavandu sukhinaha, may all be happy. And providing alms to brahmacharis and sannyasins. Um, these are individuals who are not necessarily earning, earning money in order to provide for themselves. And they depend on the grihasthas to provide them with material support because they're sustaining our dharma in crucial ways. The brahmacharis, of course, 
studying um, studying the Vedas, studying other elements of our dharma and the sannyasins, performing penance, for, performing tamas, tapas for the welfare of us all. And so the grihasthas ensure that these individuals are materially supported. And so there is, it's amazing how dharmic marriage is the sustainer um, of, of this, of all of this. Um, and so this is a snapshot of all of the different elements that we went through. And thank you so much.